at what age in your life did you get inspiration to let's say apply to Harvard? The Harvard name, I'm not going to deny, opens doors, right? Um, and I'm really grateful for that. In fact, in the music industry, it's actually worked against me. There's a very famous cafe, you might know it, Pete's. And yes. on multiple occasions, for example, on one of the few occasions, I saw the daughter of Bill Gates just casually sitting there, sipping her coffee. Yes, I had privilege. Yes, I continue to have privilege. Do I think that I have used it? Absolutely. Did I have a lot of guilt associated with it for many, many years? Absolutely. But do I think that that's a healthy thing? No. Anybody listening or watching, make sure you go like, comment, share, subscribe. I took two classes at HPS. It was about tech entrepreneurship. This is a class of 75. At the end of the 10 lecture, professor asked this really interesting question. How many of you are planning to actually start a venture after HPS? Five rose their hands. I was shocked yeah. because I thought these are the people who are going to change the world because they wrote in their essays. Hi, do you want to get into Howard, build a career in music or start a successful YouTube channel of your own? In this episode of the Shatakshi show, I am going to be talking to Avanti Navral. Avanti is one of our awardees at Global Governance Initiative 30 under 30 list for the artist category. Avanti is a graduate from Howard and is building a beautiful and a successful career of herself in the world of music. She not only shares her hacks about Howard, about music, about her journey with Berkeley, but also shares about how did she handle criticism, how did she handle a breakup while maintaining her productivity, and of course, stay till the end if you want to hear a beautiful sound with a beautiful soul till the end. And needless to say, if you like this episode of the Shatakshi Show, feel free to give it a thumbs up and of course share it with your friends so that we get motivated to inspire a lot of young professionals like you and invite a lot of young professionals like Avanti and Sahi Babali so that you all get to learn directly from all of them. And I've always maintained Shatakshi Show is an underwear from our side to make sure that you all get to learn. It's not there to maybe convince you to get into management consulting, Harvard or Global Governance Initiative or Alt IT. It's just a pure play effort from our side to share information in as much plain format as possible. So I really hope that you all get to learn from this episode of the Shatakshi Show. I hope you enjoy this one. Welcome Avanti to the Shatakshi Show. It's an extreme honor to have a young professional and that too an extremely talented young professional like you on the Shatakshi show. Over to you, would uh, absolutely love to hear your introduction. And uh, of course, needless to say, congratulations on all the accolades that you're get getting at such young age in life and on being a global governance initiative, 30 under 30 uh, for the artist category. Over to you, would absolutely love uh, your introduction and most importantly, if possible, start from the start. By that, I mean, what was childhood for you was like? Oh, wow. Okay. So we're going way back. But firstly, thank you so much, Shadakshi, for having me on the show. Um, it's a huge honor to be on the GGI list, and I'm really grateful. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Avanti Nagral. I am an artist, content creator, and entrepreneur. Um, I split time between India and the US, which is why I sound like this. And um, I am kind of on a mission to use my voice in its multiple ways, uh, primarily through the mediums of songs, stories, and conversations, and, you know, talking or singing about things that we often don't explore, topics like mental health, sexual health, you know, uncomfortable topics, or emotions that we don't explore, and um, trying to, you know, best describe them in that capacity. Um, childhood. So I was born in the U.S. I lived there till I was about nine years old. Um, I'm super grateful to my pam parents, my family for exposing me to several things, you know, growing up, I had the opportunity to dabble in sports and dance and music and art and you name it. And apparently when I was six years old, I went to them one day and I said, I choose music. Um, the fact that they believed me is one other thing, but at least that meant that they kind of pushed me more toward that direction as something that I um, engaged in very meaningfully beyond school. And music has always been a huge part of my life. When I was in, in the US in my early childhood, I grew up singing pageants and devotional music. Then when I moved to India, I started training in Indian classical music. I went to Christian high school, so I had church and gospel. Um, I've also done a fair bit of professional theater, so I've done a lot of Broadway style music. So it's always been this common thread. And um, interestingly, it wasn't until I was uh, 18, 19 that I considered doing it professionally. Before that, I had many other passions and continue to. Um, but yeah, I was on a more academic path until that point in life and, and also ended up going to, you know, to higher education institutions that were amazing um, and helped support those passions. 
wow this is certainly being a jack of all trades and rightfully so at such a young age we will explore a lot of interesting things that you said about music about emotions about social impact as well because uh, avanti shatakshi show has always been about for those young professionals who couldn't get the right guidance at young age uh, like us and hence a lot of our topics will revolve around career around lifestyle and about uh, salaries in general you mentioned a very interesting thing about uh, great two institutions at early in your life let's start from the start and maybe let's talk about howard at what age in your life did you get inspiration to let's say apply to howard and what was that entire process for you was like did you talk to your parents what was their reaction so on and so forth yeah um i think i had exposure to you know colleges in the us from a young age because i spent time there um and it was never pressure from my family that you must get into an institution but i'd seen for example my dad is in the technology world and i'd seen growing up um he did not go to a you know brand name school in the larger capacity and so i saw how for him he felt like he had to work a little bit extra hard you know um in in his capacity as an entrepreneur to say raise money as compared to his counterparts who went to colleges with more known names um what took him 10 years took them one right and so i saw that growing up and i saw kind of um for him it was always a conversation around how getting into a college or a good college whatever that means i think the definitions changed in today's world um would just act as a safety net for whatever you want to do in life you know so it was one of those things it also helped that i really enjoyed school i was good at school um it was something that i enjoyed so it felt like a natural journey um the high school i went to was pretty competitive and so you know there were a lot of students applying to many colleges in india and abroad and the high school was in india and it was definitely was one of those things that i spent a lot of time working towards but it was less about um it was less about okay i must get into xyz college because i think that if you focus in that manner the problem that occurs is that you believe that that's your end destination right as opposed to just a step along the journey that is life and so i approached my college applications for example if anybody listening to this might be you know someone who's who's applying at the moment as hey what is the step along the journey of my life and what do i eventually want to do or what do i care about even if you don't know what you want to do so when i applied to college i talked about you know caring very deeply and passionately about music and global health and impact and i continue to do that today so it wasn't you know one of these things that you try to do just to get into a college it was something that i genuinely cared about and whether or not that that manifested in that college was beside the point um of course there's different components to the process and you know one of the verticals on our youtube channel talks about that so if anybody's interested they can definitely go and see that or i'm happy to answer any questions but um I'll tell you an interesting tidbit um you know you mentioned of course the category for this is artist the harvard name i'm not going to deny opens doors right um and i'm really grateful for that but i think it opens doors in specific capacities in fact in the music industry it's actually worked against me many a time um because it it either people come in with a certain kind of bias um thinking that you know you may not be as musically talented because you have you know you are focused even on after from being berkeley you are saying that acted against you i think i think with berkeley it helps but even then sometimes people in uh, for those who don't have context i did a dual degree at harvard and the berkeley college of music i think it's it's less about that it's more about um you know i, I how do i put this it's like you you must oh you're you think you're all that even though that's obviously not the case or i hope that's not the case um and so it definitely disadvantages you in some ways uh i've seen in in the traditional artistic industries right in fact sometimes i feel like you have to prove yourself even harder despite having those backgrounds but in a way i think that that's a good thing because it keeps you keeps you grounded um it makes you realize that you know it's a level playing field when it comes to the craft um at the same time i'm so 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 grateful for the education i had at both institutions because you know at harvard i was studying psychology and global health i got to meet some of the most brilliant people in the fields um amazing friends amazing professors you know thought leaders and then at berkeley i was able to really hone in you know like you said the my jack of all trades musical skills felt like they finally fit together in a puzzle piece into developing my voice and sound into what it is today 
very beautiful uh, experience sharing thanks avanti for that and um, i was i lived uh, for a shorter period of time in cambridge uh, i did my exchange semester at fetcher school of law and diplomacy and till date i've realized how entire privileged that ecosystem is there's a very famous uh, cafe you might know it peets and yes. on multiple occasion for example on one of the few occasions i saw the daughter of bill gates just casually sitting there sipping her coffee and okay. if someone is extremely determined you can just make so much from that uh, ecosystem on that note i wanted to quickly check from you have you watched uh, this show on netflix never have i ever and there is this character called devi in it yes i have seen the show do you relate to, to that character in any bits and for or format i think so i think that she's written as a character to relate a lot to the diaspora experience you know for kids growing up in the us I think I've had a unique experience where I did grow up in the US for a majority of my childhood and even when I lived in India I'd spend every summer there but um because my teenage years were in India I think that um it's interesting yes she is Indian yes she's portrayed as such but that's not necessarily the experience that Indians or South Asians who live in India have right I and mean, it's always been this interesting dichotomy I remember when I got to college I found myself being able to relate to the experiences of kids who grown up mostly in the US of kids who grown up mostly in India and also neither because when you've grown up no because when you grow up in the US right particularly in spaces kind of what they're trying to portray you are navigating being brown or indian or whatever that means and you kind of have to defend that identity and and be the 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 bearer of it right um whereas when you grow up in india everyone around you is is like that even though there's a lot of subcultural diversity in india and that's something we can unpack um for sure i think the experience of navigating that identity so what i found is a lot of people who grew up in india find it a little bit strange when you know people born in the diaspora will think that culture means the clothes the food you know um because that's what it means for them those are the ways in which they were able to hang on to it religion perhaps whatever it might be whereas those folks may not have seen india grow in the way that it is today and i feel like for what for multiple reasons they are stuck in what i like to call cultural freeze whereby they're stuck in the year in which their parents immigrated because that's the cultural projection they're growing up with it's different if you come and spend time back and forth but my 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 basic point is that i think it's a beautiful show and i think that that plus other representations are really cool and it's not representative of the full experience you know the same way in which someone growing up elsewhere won't necessarily relate to a high school show set in uh, india because it's not it's not the same thing but the the i think the common takeaway is she's a high school student but i think no matter what age you are you do feel these confusions around identity grief loss longing love exploration and and that's just human um nature and and, and i like that that's a universal topic overall beautifully summarized it's almost like saying that irrespective of your region culture and belongings at the end of the day the rock bottom reality is that we all are extremely similar i also really take a lot of pride in the fact that avanti you were talking about people write essays to these ivy league institutes and yeah. at the end of the day what they do in life many a times may not resonate with what they say in those essays so uh, very famously in fact few of my friends were extremely privileged to go to harvard business school and because of the kind of loan that they took eventually yeah. they couldn't justify what they really wanted to do on that note would you feel comfortable perhaps sharing certain aspects of your application someone watching this podcast is 17 or 18 and is dreaming big can can i go to harvard uh, like avanti did what will be certain aspects that you might want to highlight that helped uh, you get in Yeah for sure. Um first thing is it has to be unique to you. It cannot be, you know, you might say for example we might watch this and say oh Avanti said music and global health let me do that. No no no. They're going to see through that. They know what is what feels authentic to you. You have and and no matter what it is that you genuinely care about, how have you taken whatever it is you care about to the highest level possible with the resources available to you? For example, you're interested in I don't know cooking, right? Um how have you taken that to the highest level possible? are you someone who likes to cook in a community around you are you somebody who wants to i don't know um make recipes and maybe have you put that together um or is it something that's meaningful to you because you do it with your grandmother and you feel like that's a way to pass down tradition right whatever it might be how are you taking it to the highest level even when it comes to say something more academic 
say you're interested in science and research, there's probably many, many opportunities at your school. How are you maximizing those and also going a little bit beyond? Are there places and competitions you can submit to? Are there people you can shadow? Are there, inter you know, there's so many options and not from a point of, I need to do 20 million things. It's truly just, if you genuinely care about something, you're gonna do everything possible to try to make it happen, right? Um, so that's just the core of, you know, what you kind of share. At the end of the day, when you apply, your application ends up being 10 pieces of paper. Right, your scores matter, all of these things matter, but they're baseline. If it's a 10 piece of pa page of paper or stack, how are you gonna differentiate yourself? And the only way you can do that is the components of the application that involve your voice. What do I mean by that? Your essay is one of the only places that they get to hear you and your voice. So if you make your essay like a, you know, what folks call an SOP, which is a statement of purpose, where it's like, I like doing this because this, because that, they can, Look at your resume and be like, okay, I know this person does 10 things. How is that unique to them? Your voice is, why do you do those things? What makes you tick? Is there, is there something in your life that inspired you to, to care about something? Is there a person who's had an impact on you? Who are you, the person? Are you funny? Are you not? If you're, if you're not funny, don't try to be funnier in your essay. It will be really bad. Um, are you intentional? Are you kind? Do you like telling stories? Whatever it is, how can that voice come out? That's the only place your voice comes out. The other place a voice comes out in your application is in your recommendations. Um, your recommendations, I think, are extremely, extremely important, and a lot of people don't pay attention to them. I remember speaking with my admissions officer after I got in, and she said that among the many things that, you know, they, they found impressive about my application, the thing that, you know, stood out to her the most was how, how glowing of recommendations that I had in the capacity. She's like, these people were so, the fact that you impressed these people at the age of 16, 17, whatever it is, and they're such huge advocates for you, speaks a lot to your potential, right? Is essentially what she said. And that's because the folks that I got recommendations from, they weren't just saying, oh, she's good at English. She's good at math. They were saying, I have seen the way she interacts with XYZ classmates and helps them feel a certain way or whatever it might be, right? So when you choose folks to recommend you, both inside and outside of school, inside and outside of your context, choose people who know you as a human because that's way more important because they can lend that voice. And I, I genuinely think that those two things make the biggest difference. Everything else is baseline statistics and luck. Wow. I really like your answer because at the end of the day, Avanti, you are questioning one thing, which is who are you? Yeah. If we can crack that, and uh, very rarely, I think uh, very few uh, people crack that at an age of 18, then or 16, like you said, should find uh, their way. And I'm so glad that uh, you were able to find that answer. And it's a continuous answer. And I kind of still feel bad that people run a rat race, turn yeah. 30, turn 40, do what others are doing, maybe emulate Avanti, emulate Shatakshi. But when you'll be 50, you look back and then you'll have uh, regrets. On the lines of, once again, education institutes, and I'm kind of using that as a segue towards your YouTube journey. So here are you, a student who has been at Howard, who is studying music at Berkeley, and you are now becoming a YouTuber. What inspired yeah. you to start uh, your YouTube channel? At what stage did you realize that this is what I want to do? Um, if you asked me a few years ago, I've been doing YouTube for like two and a half years now. If you asked me four years ago, would I, would I ever be a YouTuber? I'd be like, you're out of your mind because it was just never something on my radar. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I used to do professional theater. Um, and so I've been a performing artist for a while. I took a gap year before going to college, uh, because I had the opportunity to do this theater show that was, you know, touring all across India. Best decision ever for three reasons. One, it allowed me to realize the power of art really deeply. Um, we almost got arrested for putting on this play. It was a whole whole situation. And it made me realize the power of, you know, the, the play touched upon things like mental health, child abuse, and it made me realize the power of art. If anyone's interested, just Google Agnes of God controversy. I was playing Agnes. Don't even put in Avanti, don't even put in India, and you'll see hundreds of articles about this craziness. Um, I also, during that year, started writing music uh, realized that I had a voice beyond just the literal singing voice. 
and I'm really grateful. The other, the other thing, as you mentioned earlier about the rat race, was actually I was burnt out after high school, if I'm being super honest with you. And it gave me a chance to deeply connect with myself. And so when I got to college, I was not thinking, oh, this person's doing this, that person's doing that. Let me do these 10,000 things. I was there, I was like, I care about these themes in the world. This is why I'm here. I want to learn about these things. I care about doing what I do. And so at that point, I'd, I'd entered what you can call the independent music industry, right? I started releasing music. I would perform in Boston, in New York occasionally, in India. And um, I was pretty clear that post-graduation, I wanted to go into the creative industries. You know, music's very difficult industry to be in and to, to make money from, to be very honest with you. But I was pretty clear that post-graduation, I wanted to go into music full-time. And I also used to do a lot of public speaking. So I was going to, you know, in music and public speaking. But life had other plans. Um, I graduated during the pandemic in 2020 and uh, my last semester was online. I had come to India so I could be with my family. And uh, you know, I could have said, okay, let me try to enter a different industry or something else because obviously you can't perform live, you can't speak live, do any of these things. And I decided, hey, no, actually the things that I care most about these things are the community that you build from them. And uh, in today's world, especially with the despair and hopelessness that, you know, kind of had crept in, um, if that means building community through the digital world, so be it. So I started, you know, um, I think YouTube was the easier format at the time for me. TikTok, et cetera, had started and then subsequently got banned. But short form felt really foreign to somebody like me who hadn't consumed it. But long form felt like, hey, I'm talking to a friend. You know, I'm, I'm having that conversation. Uh, and that's kind of how I started. And, and there were multiple different things, you know, of course, music being a primary vertical, education was one of them. And the reason I, I even made videos talking about higher education, say Harvard, et cetera, was because I remember when I was applying, I went to a school that had resources. We had a guidance counselor. Many students from my school had gone to colleges abroad before. There are so many people in India who don't have that, right? And so either they have to pay independent counselors a crazy amount of money, or they just don't have that information. And most of the information that was student voices that I'd seen were primarily American students, which is awesome, but they don't understand. If someone asks them what's like ICSC versus SSC versus IB versus state fund, they'll be like, what are these words, you know? And so I was like, okay, for somebody who might've heard the name Harvard, how do I break this process down? Because you're just used to saying, what marks do I need to get into an institution? Because ours is a very marks-based you know, system. But that's not the case for these things. So I, I tried to break that process down, made a bunch of videos in those spaces, and I realized the need for it. And you know, that's something that we took a little bit of a pause from uh, last year, but kind kind of trying to rebring that back because we realized the importance of not gatekeeping, right? So my my whole thing when it comes to any of the content we make or share, it a lot of it's about how do you prevent gatekeeping? Because if you've been given a lot of privileges in life, and I recognize that from a young age. Um, whether that's education access, health, money, um, there's a reason, right? And I'm not saying that everybody needs to feel this sense of duty or responsibility, but if you've been given certain privileges in life, how do you make sure that A, you're not misusing them, uh, B, if you have them, okay, how do you use that to, to grow further in life, but to also hopefully help create spaces for others that didn't have that same starting point and bring everybody along with you? That's always been my mission. I absolutely love the concept around breaking gatekeeping. And on that note, perhaps would want to pick your brains now on the music industry. While of course you are figuring your path out, you may be really way ahead than a lot of amateur musicians who are just getting started. So imagine if music is like a puzzle, there will be certain important components in the puzzle to be able to crack that entire puzzle. So for you, what have what are certain most important puzzles for an amateur to pick up if he or she is trying to build a career in music like uh, you have? So when people think of a career in music, they usually think it means working on your craft, which it does, you know, working on the actual singing, maybe writing, maybe posting on social media, because that's what people see. When you say the career or the industry, there are so many things that go on behind the scenes that people don't pay attention to, and they don't necessarily set themselves up for long-term success. What do I mean by that? If you create a song, you are essentially creating intellectual property. Any kind form of intellectual property needs to be copyrighted for it to be exploited monetarily or just in general for it to be protected, right? 
Now, when it comes to music, there's multiple forms of copyright that people just don't even know about. India is still getting there to, to protect a copyright for songwriters and it's, it's a whole thing. Um, but essentially there is multiple types of copyright. There's something called the master, there's the composition, there's a legal aspect of it, there's the business aspect of it, there's something called publishing, there's something called sync. And, and it's about understanding each of those components before getting in. It's not as simple as like, ah, oh, post, done, right? Um, there's so much that goes on into the business side of it. And even if you work with a team, I am really blessed to have an incredible management team now, which has taken me a long time to find. I've worked with several different folks. You need to know all aspects of it so you don't get taken for a ride. And so that you learn how to run it like a business, like a startup truly, because as an artist, you are not just the product or the face of the brand, you are also the entrepreneur, you're also creating the pieces. And sometimes it's hard to have distinction from yourself, right? You kind of need to think of yourself as, that's why some artists have stage names, right? Lady Gaga, Divine, you name it. There's so many folks have stage names because it's easier for them to be the human working toward that brand. When you're someone like me, who's a Latina girl on screen, off screen, on stage, off stage, that was very intentional because I kind of wanted to be the same person in all capacities. But it gets hard and you sometimes blur the person and the persona. So you, you really need to understand that. The other thing I would say is, see, in my opinion, the craft is a baseline and should be. But not a lot of young, a lot of young people think that something just needs to blow up and then you're done. It's not about even if you have a viral moment, it's not about the viral moment or the multiple. It's about how do you use that and build a longstanding career. And the things that people get invested in are not just the song, that would be amazing, but it's about who you are as a person, who you are as an artist and what you stand for. So, you know, trying, trying to, it, it comes back to the same thing, whether we're talking about education, whether we're talking about, you know, like, like the essay you might write for college. The, and this is in any kind of capacity, even as an entrepreneur, who are you or who is the product? What is it that I care about? Why do I want to inject my passion into this? And then if you end up being the product yourself, then there's a whole other loop that you have to have in your brain. Wow, my brain, like you said, the business brain specifically is thinking in all the interesting directions in which you took the conversation, especially uh, around music. And thanks for sharing that. Avanti, you very briefly talked about privilege and I want to double click on it. The definition of privilege could be multifold. In your experience, how would you define privilege? And if that is the definition of privilege, do you think you were privileged? And if yes, again, how do you think you used it? Or do you think there is another way in which I could have used it better and I still fell short in using it? So a long question, largely around privilege. Um, I think each and every one of us, each and every one of us grows up with a sense of privilege, whatever that might be, right? Some of us, for some of us, that's socioeconomic privilege. For some of us, that's family and support structure privilege. For some people, it's network. There's so many different ways. For some people, it's health. Um, so to, to answer parts of your question, was that, did I grow up privileged? Absolutely. The fact that I you know, could access two different countries, very few people can do that. Um, I, I did grow up with a lot of physical health difficulties. Um, they, some of which were extremely severe, near death experiences, had brain viruses that affected my vision, um, had you know heart conditions, many of these situations that at the time, you know, felt really debilitating. Um, but in all of that, I recognized that I had privilege because my family was able to support my access to care. All my grandparents were doctors, so we knew a lot of doctors, right? My family had baseline affordability to be able to afford care. If I wasn't able to afford being in a hospital, I would be dead today, right? And so I think from a really early age, recognizing that um, was huge. And so for me, that's why health became a huge part of my life and, and health equity, recognizing that I had access to things that a lot of people in this world, especially in the global South, do not have access to. So how do you, how do you make sure that access to basic birth control is not a privilege? How do you make sure that access to basic mental health and mental, re mental health resources are not a privilege? You know, basic first aid, just, just, just basics, right? And so that became, that's why global health really interested me and, and it's something that I cared deeply about. Um, when it comes to other things, uh, were there, you know, ups and downs in different ways? Absolutely. But that's everybody's life. On the whole, I'm extremely and acutely aware of privilege and the way I, and I, the way I define that is, did you have access? Did you have exposure? Did you have resources? Um, if not, did you know how to obtain them? 
because sometimes even if you don't have the resources, just the knowledge of how to obtain them is a form of privilege. And so, you know, for example, in my capacity right now, I recognize that I cannot distribute resources. I'm not in a position to do that yet, but can I distribute knowledge on how to access resources? Yes. And so hopefully that brings people one step closer. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's super important to acknowledge your privilege. Did I have struggles? Absolutely, but of a particular nature and everybody does, right? Um, I was severely bullied when I was young to the extent that I was chased around with a saw. Like there's many, many things one can unpack, right? Um, but those are all different in comparison to the baseline. There's a, there's a pyramid um, called Maslow's hierarchy that folks look at in psychology, right? Where it essentially has your baseline needs, food, clothing, shelter, water, and then above that, certain types of other needs. And, and the, the top of the peak is, is self-actualization. And um, for folks who are fighting for survival and fighting to put food on the table every single day, they can't think of things beyond that, right? And so that's why I think equity is so, so, so important. We talk about equality all the time, but equity is really just making sure that we have stacked access to resources so that people at different starting points then have the ability to access different things. So this is a very long answer to your long question, but essentially the TLDR is, yes, I had privilege. Yes, I continue to have privilege. Do I think that I have used it? Absolutely. Um, did I have a lot of guilt associated with it for many, many years? Absolutely. But um, do I think that that's a healthy thing? No, because I think that if you're given certain cards in life, you can either ignore them completely um, and start from scratch, which I think is another form of privilege off that ego to be able to do that. Second, you can be really spoiled and you can say, ah, oh, this is the life, you know, funny enough, this is my background. I'll sit here with a drink and, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> or, or you can say, hey, this is where I started in life. How do I make sure that I help increase the baseline for others? I completely concur to that. And I also know of many, many examples of people who were born with relatively higher privilege and couldn't make better use of it. And I'm so glad that in the art industry and in the social impact industry, you're able to leverage it for your own career and to advance someone else's career. I'll take a step back and perhaps do a contrast of your career with, let's say, your peers who graduated your class, same department, someone else's, uh, some other department. So could you give an example of the kind of careers they are having, maybe your friends who graduated your class? And are you also able to collaborate with extremely different department people with the work that you are trying to do right now? Um, so majority of my graduating class from college went into consulting, banking, or finance, which is awesome for them. And some in tech. Some people love those fields and I'm so, so happy for them. Some people use those fields as easy money, stop, stop gaps, because they don't necessarily know what they kind of want to do. Um, I think we need people in those fields, but one thing that really truly disappointed me was coming in, there were so many kids who went to an institution like mine who were so passionate about changing something in the world, whatever that might be. And flash forward four years later, so many of them once upon graduating, either no longer cared or cared, but they were like, yeah, but I kind of want to focus on making money first, et cetera. And that's great. If you're able to get yourself to a position where you're extremely financially independent, can build those resources to give, amazing but the, the the issue is four years out I see people they don't do that because they're so used to that life and lifestyle and it's like yeah this is just the way it is you know um because in my opinion if someone with the brand name institution like the one I went to cannot take a risk then who can right because let's say tomorrow everything fails I know I can go back and get a job that's the safety net that this degree provides me I can do whatever, start from scratch again, and I can get a job that pays me decently, you know? Um, my contemporaries, for the most part, are making a good salary. Um, it took me longer to get to that same point monetarily. And because I run it as a business, I reinvest almost everything. So I'm not necessarily pocketing a lot of that. And that's an intentional choice right now. I could, but I, I see more value in reinvesting to build higher for a potential longer gain, right? That's just the way I think of it and see it right now. Um, but does that mean that, say, my peers might do have other life milestones before me? Absolutely. Um, some of them may be buying their first house soon or their first car soon. Um, this 
has not is unrelated to financial stability, but I think it should be. Many of them are starting to get engaged and married, right? Um, and so <laughs> I just think that you just have to accept it, right? If you've chosen a slightly non-traditional path in life, you're like, okay, it may not be the same kinds of milestones, the same kinds of benchmarks, but but that's really it. In terms of collaborating with folks from different industries, absolutely. That's what I love about in the music aspect, um, less so because you have to collaborate more within folks there, but because I also am a creator and, and when I say entrepreneur, we have a couple of ventures. I have a production company and a studio space that the whole idea is to, to have young talent or in the creative spaces, but also not be able to access creative dreams and make them come to life. And I can talk about that if you're interested, but I'm able to interface with a lot of different people because through the medium of conversation, you can talk to anybody. Right. And um, we're currently working on it's under wraps. We're working on a pod podcast project, a few other things where uh, part of the point is to spotlight some things that we don't necessarily see. Right. Because when we think about the creative industry, we think about glamour, but it also allows us to just have a story based spin on so many things that we see in our mundane daily life. Right. Something as simple as I have made videos talking about sexually transmitted infections. Right? That might be a very specific niche area and th that you should know about. I've studied psychology, I've studied sexual health, neuroscience, biology. But the fun part for me is how do I make that compelling for somebody to understand and listen? Because not everyone's going to go read about it. They're going to be like, these are big words. So how do you use a 15 second video to explain what it is? And that's the fun part for me, which is how do I take these more complex things or you know, typically inaccessible things and make them fun and educational at the same time? Um, as a person, I also extremely value intellectual diversity. So my closest friends are not from the creative industries. I do have some close friends in the creative industries, of course, but the people I surround myself with most are from various different backgrounds. And that's extremely intentional because I think that if you surround yourself with people who are just like you or who are working on similar things, while that's amazing and you learn a lot, you sometimes believe that that world is the world and you forget that there's so much more to the world outside. I'm smiling ear to ear because Avanti, very few people crack such things, especially at such young age in life. For example, not having an echo chamber. In fact, the, one of the best things that happened in my 20s was befriending someone who didn't do his MBA, who was not from McKinsey BCGs of the world. And then suddenly I started seeing another set of Venn diagram that I had completely not seen. And on your point, uh, on your graduating class, not starting something much more impactful, at least in the short term, uh, it took me back a few years uh, ago. I took two classes at HPS. It was about tech entrepreneurship. This is a class of 75. At the end of the 10 lecture, professor asked this really interesting question. How many of you are planning to actually start a venture after HPS? five rows in their hands I was shocked yeah. because I thought these are the people who are going to change the world because they wrote in their essays maybe they will in some shape or format I think definition of impact is also important but perhaps yeah. not in the uh, format of entrepreneurship the class that uh, we were taking on that note I might have a little hard open-ended question for you so VC and Avanti who is graduated from a Ivy League Institute doing, doing really well on YouTube is now getting into music what are your dreams in life? What are my dreams in life? Uh, funny thing is I've actually been in the music industry way longer than I've been on the internet. Just for a lot of people, they don't necessarily know that or see that. Um, my dreams in life truly are just to, to use my voice in its many ways, right? And um, that can mean through all the mediums that, that I'm grateful to now because all the digital community we've been able to build allows me to, for example, at last week, two weeks ago, I was in Rwanda at um, the world's largest gender equity conference. And I was there representing India, but in general, um, because it was a great opportunity to be able to spotlight the work that's happening in the world in that way and amplify these voices that are that are doing incredible work in these fields, right? Opportunities like that are incredible. And, and, and part of it is I used to have this idea of a dream that had a particular shape and I've learned that it's probably better to not for the simple reason that things keep changing, right? So I think it's better, according to me, to have a sense of purpose as opposed to a specific dream. And for me, that sense of purpose comes from, am I using my voice to its fullest? Am I helping amplify other voices to their fullest? And are we building 
community and impact along the way. So that might take the shape of at some point, potentially even building a startup, right? That might take the shape in some point of building a nonprofit that might take shape in who knows, right? Because at that point, what is the metaverse? Who is, what is technology, right? So I, I think it's less about, this is the dream I see. Um, I do hope that a, a life, and, and I'm grateful that that is the form of life today, but I ho hope that a life in the future involves me you know, being able to, to do all these things, to sing, to speak, to create, um, that I might even involve acting, right? It, whatever that might be, just the medium of the voice, but also making time for people in my life outside of that, because at the, as much as I love what I do and as difficult as it, as it can be, because it's the person persona complication, um, I also wanna make sure that I am not just my job and I'm not just consumed by that, right? Uh, yesterday, I, I just got back um, from a long trip. I was in the US for three, three months for work. And I was sitting next to an older gentleman who asked me, he's like, what are your hobbies? And I thought about it and I was like, oh, do I have any? Because what most people would consider traditional hobbies is technically a part of my work, right? Even though, sure, do I like to dance? Yes, but do I need to learn how to do it for my work? Yes. Um, there's so many different things that, apologies. Um, there's so many different things. I, I was talking to a friend afterward and he's like, yeah, you, you don't have any hobbies because you monetized all of them or they all, they, they help you, right? In that sense. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. What am I doing just for the sake of me? I don't know. And I want to be able to have that in life, you know, not to say it's a beautiful life to live, to be able to genuinely do the things you love and are passionate about and make a living off of those. That's the dream for so many people. And at the same time, sometimes when you do that, you, uh, it feels like sometimes ends up feeling like majburi, you know, an obligation. Um, and you need to find the reasons why you started doing what you did in the first place and fall back in love with it. I absolutely loved your answer on not having a hobby. It's the same conundrum that I'm going in my life as well. For the longest time, I wrote blogs and then I slowly and steadily started writing very often on LinkedIn that I will no longer call it a hobby. I think hobby traditionally is something that you do less often than yeah. more often. So perhaps I'm also in need of finding uh, a new hobby. With that, uh, Avanti, I might want to pivot and talk about something personal. Feel free to not answer that question. When I was looking about you on YouTube, I came across this video about you sharing about your breakup, which can be very emotionally heartbreaking to someone especially in his or her early 20s and yet I saw you still going strong on your craft so here is someone who is emotionally at that point of time really weak but at the same time really going strong for his or her craft how did you balance both at such a young age uh it wasn't easy and I appreciate you bringing that up um that relationship was six years long which is a long time in anybody's life but at that age it was 25 percent of my life right uh, this is a year ago. And so it had been something that impacted me in many ways. And I could have chosen to stay quiet about it, but I knew that if I did, because I had chosen to share about the relationship, people would have had questions. They might have even come for the other person because they didn't have information. I was like, let me just put out information and that's it. And it was interesting because in the first, so what I, what I done was the day after it happened, I filmed myself because for the last two and a half years, I've been talking to a camera every single day of my life. So it's where I sometimes feel most raw and vulnerable. I filmed myself a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, just to document my own progress. And two months later, I decided, okay, I'm comfortable sharing and I can share, hey, this has happened. And I felt comfortable putting out a snippet of the video I made on the first day. Um, within the first 48 hours, uh, there were tens of thousands of people who reached out with their own stories of grief and vulnerability and saying things like, I felt so alone when something similar happened to me. Um, it was hard to see you cry, but the fact that I saw that made me feel like I wasn't crazy when I did, right? You know, things of that nature, people sharing their own stories, their comfort. And then 24 hours later, I was on every meme page, every reaction page, every Rose channel. Um, and it was a lot of people with the kind of energy of mockery, but to the degree of really inhumaneness. Um, 
you know, uh, reducing it to, firstly, any woman with a platform, right, can be threatening to a lot of people. And there's a lot of men on the internet and a lot of them were saying really nasty things. Um, you know, pardon my language, but this is what was said to me on a daily basis. You've sucked white dick, now suck mine. Um, they were calling me a roti huirandi, which, you know, means a crime prostitute, whatever it is. That's just, that's the surface. There was a way worse. And it was very interesting. It, it, it took a huge toll on my mental health. You know, it would be different if I went somewhere and was bashing somebody or saying something. I was truly just sharing my experience and saying, this is how I'm feeling. This is a reason this has ended and it had nothing to do with even me. And there were several other reasons, but out of respect to the person and to the relationship, I just shared, you know, someone doesn't want to live in this place and logistically that's not compatible for us anymore. Um, and it was very interesting. So I learned, you know, I, I alluded to the person persona thing earlier, um, but I never felt it as deeply as I did then for multiple reasons. For example, I released a song uh, shortly after and a lot of people in the comments were like, oh, this bitch is monetizing her breakup by writing the song. And what was fascinating was there were a lot of folks saying, oh, so you have no problem when Taylor Swift does this or Ariana Grande does this or other artists do this. That's literally the job of an artist to take their pain or take their emotional experience and create something of it. Um, and it, it made me realize how far A, we have to go in our own music industry because we're, as, a, as, an, as a country, we love heartbreak, we love emotion, but we love it in the context of fantasy. We love seeing it in film. We love it in the context of reality TV. But when it's someone's real story, we get really disturbed, you know, because it's like, oh, and uh, the other thing was, because I talk about certain things that are often uncomfortable, you know, I've talked about sex, sexual health, things of that nature, people, I've, I've been used to hate, right? So people will naturally say things, but when someone hates on someone talking about like that, talking about a subject like that, to me, that only motivates me further, right? Because it shows the need for education. But when people were hating around that time, they were hating based on, they've seen one meme and something else, and so they're making an impression. And they were throwing hate and it felt personal, even though I had to tell myself the same thing that, hey, this is the persona. They don't know you. They don't know anything. They've just seen something and made an impression off of that. So it was, I really had to develop thick skin. Um, but I think it, the reason I kept going, because it could have like shut me off the internet, right? I know so many folks um, were like, I'm surprised that you, and I said, you know what? That's what they want. They want to be able to back you into a corner. They, and, and that means they've won and it's not a competition. It was more, hey, you doing this to somebody, okay, you've done this to me, I've been on the internet for a while, fine, I can deal with it. Imagine a young person just sharing anything. And so it became this whole thing, I'm like, I, I need to continue just for the sake of making sure other people know how to deal with this if they ever do, you know? Wow. I would say I'm really amazed, Avanti, you kept going strong. I cannot imagine a younger version of me in that situation. In fact, whatever mini public persona I've been able to build, I quickly realized in my life, I need very strong community around myself to be able to survive and thrive in this ecosystem. And while you have touched a little bit about this, it was going to be my extension of the question. Are there certain ways through which a young professional like you handled criticism. I am asking this from the point of view of once again, someone who's just getting started. So were there oh. certain institutional methods through which you handled this entire criticism around you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at any, every point you get criticism, right? Um, I think you get criticism at different points along the journey, right? And that's just a natural part of the process. I think criticism is also healthy, right? Um, however, when you're on the internet like that, you tend to get a lot of voices that tend to be nameless, faceless, and are projecting their insecurities on you. Um, my dad once told me opinions are like assholes. Everyone has one. So, you know, you just have to remember that. That being said, don't, don't discount everybody's opinion. I think when people are genuinely, you know, criticizing you constructively, for example, let's say people who've been supporting you for a while, they're like, hey, actually this song didn't sound that great. I'm like, you know, okay, I will take that with a pinch of salt, I will reflect, or, hey, this came across as tone deaf, or whatever it might be. Taking those into consideration are extremely important, in my opinion. Someone hating just for hating's sake, I wish them well, because I know they're going through something in life. 
someone having their own insecurities, and this will happen in daily life too, it's just on the internet, it's easier to project, right? In, in daily life, no one's going to come to you and say, eh, bitch, right? But on the internet, they, it's just fingers. <laughs> so, keyboard warriors. Keyboard warriors. Um, and there are, the thing that's really important to me about hate and hate speech is protecting my community more than myself, because I think I have developed thick skin. And um, I think when people start fighting with people in the community, that makes me really upset. So there are ways to do that. For example, these type of these platforms have ways in which you can ban certain words, right? Or filter out certain things or reporting mechanisms. And those are important, right? I do think, however, whenever I do spotlight, like, hey, I never show the face or name of the person, not a lot of people are like, well, you should show that so nobody ever does that again. And I'm like, well, that's also perpetuating a cycle of hate, right? Because then people who support you will hate on them. And then it, it's an endless cycle. You just need to nip it in the bud. Um, I think criticism is important. I think it's important to have sounding boards. My team, for example, are not yes men. Um, firstly, my team is primarily women. So that phrase wouldn't even apply. But besides that, um, I think it's important that you're able to disagree. And I think it's important that you're able to have, surround yourself with people who think differently from you. Now, you may or may not agree with them and you may or may not even go with what they're saying, but having someone challenging you does the same thing as we were talking about earlier, which is preventing yourself from being in an echo chamber. And especially when you're in a public type of thing, when it's really easy to have the echo chamber of enough people telling you, you're awesome, you're amazing you can gas yourself up to the point that you are immune, right? Which is which is not a good thing because everyone's still human and everyone needs to grow. Do you want to end this part by humming your favorite uh, beat or your favorite music? My favorite beat or music? Uh, that's a really hard question. What's my favorite? It's actually not a question. It's perhaps a musical request. Um, the song is called, What Was I Made For? Um, and I think it's a fun way to end this because we've been talking so much about identity. I used to fall, now I just fall down. I used to know, but I'm not sure now what I was made for. What was I made for? Taking a trip, I was an ideal. Looked so alive. Turns out I'm not real. Just something you pay for. What was I made for? I, I don't know how it'll feel.